as a child, I was fascinated with deep wells. <laughs> <laughs> the wells that are deep, dark, cold, merciless, all stemmed from a simple fable my father, my humble father, an un educated father, have told us when I was young. I'd like to share this simple fable to you today. It is about this little frog born into a deep well. For all his life, he was taught the limitation of sky, the occasional stars and moon, but mainly this dreadful cold <coughs> and darkness was all life had offered. Only then his father confessed to his son. He had also heard there's a bigger and a better world up there, far more to see, to enjoy, to live. But he didn't believe it. He went to his father, he said, Father, that can't be true. Others can't have more than we do. But he didn't realize his father and his forefathers before him had struggled, struggled all their lives but there's simply no way out for them. The land was too far away for them to ever escape. So his father told his son to give up hope, accept the sad fate, the deep, dark, cold, merciless wells they were born into. His father told him to conform to the reality of life. That was the sad fable I had heard as a child. But perhaps along the way, my father had to give up hope of ever escape his own deep wells. But for me, upon hearing that story, made me even more stubborn. I stubbornly believed and secretly wished one day, maybe one day, an opportunity will come my way, allow me a simple chance, chance to get out, to do something better than my father or my forefathers. The one near miss in my life was one time there was a simple piece of bread was missing. Everybody accused me in the family of nine. I was born into a, with the six brothers and my parents. So seven boys. Of course, I was notorious in my family knowing to steal food particularly good food. <laughs> I have no smelling where the food is. <laughs> coincidentally, coincidentally, I was born into the year of a rat. <laughs> so everybody, whenever there's food missing, they said, the rat has stolen it. <laughs> so that time wasn't me. Definitely was not me. But everybody blamed me. I was so disheartened. Even my mother, who I love so dear, I was so close to her, she even accused me was my fault for that missing piece of bread. So I ran wild into the cold darkness and I suddenly stumbled on the edge of the deep well we normally fit the water from. It was eyes formed around the edge, was very slippery. My thought then was I was gonna dive in and my life there. I guess as a child, as a teenager, you all have these kind of suicidal thoughts. That was the first time I experienced that. But you know what saved me? Was when I was about to close my eyes, go go down. I was, as a child, I was never afraid of death, never. I still don't. So, but my mother's kind face, her eyes, the desperation I saw her when there was no food on the table just to feed her seven sons. The words that my parents said, you go ahead and eat, we're not hungry, even though we knew they were hungry. There was the times my father broke his back. He was in such high temperature, he still had to go to work, so bring home that little bit of food to save our lives. Those are the images that saved my life that day. But there's one important realization at that moment when I give up throwing myself into the deep well. Then I, I realized that from before that moment, I was about 10 then, before that moment, 
I've relied everything on my parents. Food, washing clothes, sewing, everything. But from that moment onwards, I thought I could do something about it. If I really love my parents, if I really want to perhaps ch help change their lives, then I could make a contribution. I could get, my, some my, get, my, get up my uh, butt and to maybe work along the side of my father. From that moment on, onwards, I had a secret dream, the dream of make a difference in my parents, in my brother's lives. But most importantly, I dreamed big to have one chance in my life to allow me to get out that deep where I was born into. So that one incredible chance at age 11 just happened. I was sitting in this uh, heatless, freezingly cold classroom, which made a simple mud coming shack. Worse looking than that, that's the village I was born into. There's no heating, there's no uh, electricity, there's two, there were two tiny little windows, no glass panels, thin rice papers, so thin enough for the light to shine through. Uh, the temperature in my hometown could get, could get down to below 20 degrees below zero. It was one of these cold mornings. The wind just absolutely pouring in through the broken uh, rice papers. We were wearing these thick cotton quilted cotton pants our mothers have sewn for us. With that, we look like, we look like these round snowballs. <laughs> We were, sitting this, uh, we were sitting in front of this Chairman Mao and uh, Marx, Angels, Lenin, Stalin, big photos in front of the, of the blackboard. We were told this, to read this We Love You, We Love You, Chairman Mao text 10 times in a row. You can well imagine just how heartwarming that was. <laughs> and in the middle of that reading, four men walk into our room. They were introduced to us as Madam Mao's cultural advisors from the Beijing Dance Academy, and they were there to select talents to study ballet. Of course, we didn't know anything about ballet. So they then asked all to stand up to sing songs, which you could well guess the only kind of songs we were ever told and allowed to sing was We Love You, Chairman Mao kind of songs. So in the middle of that singing, they walk along the aisles, look at each person's faces, and this little one girl. Just as they were walk, walking her out the door, my class teacher hesitated. And I suddenly tapped on the shoulder of the very last gentleman, virtually just as he was about to walk out of the room. She said to him, excuse me, sir, what about that one? And that one was me. Then I followed this, the last man, went into the head of school's office. There were 10 of us selected between the age of eight to 12. We all lined up and uh, they scream out, they said, take all your clothes off, clothes off except your underwears. But nobody moved. The reason for that was because we were so poor those days, nobody could afford to wear a pair of underwears. So eventually these strippers bare, they measured every inch of our bodies. At one stage I pushed against the corner of the wall. One person held a wide knee straight. Second person pushed both my shoulders hard against the wall against one of the walls, I could not move a single inch. And the third person forced my other leg up, up, and up, high up in the air. As he forced my leg higher and higher, he kept asking me, does it hurt? You can well imagine, it was excruciating. During, the, during that, that, that audition process, they had torn both of my hamstrings. But suddenly, I kept smiling, shook my head, and I said, no, didn't hurt. I realized then, if I, if I screamed out with pain that moment, which I desperately wanted to do, but if I have done so, that one, possibly only opportunity in my life would have taken away from me, may never have such a chance to return. And eventually they went through that commune, county, city, provincial, national level, all across China they searched and searched. They went through millions of kids across China, across China, they only selected 44. I was one of the lucky 44 kids being chosen. Had to leave my beloved mother, father, their love, the comfort of my home behind to strike out on my own. That day started this enchanted, amazing journey. 
Even though I did not know about barley, but one thing I knew from that moment onwards, I could have enough food to eat. And perhaps a chance for me to do good in whatever I did, be able to come back and help the rest of my family, to be able to get them out of that deep well. I trained in Beijing for seven long years and only, only allowed to see them once a year. You'd be surprised to hear this. I was hopeless at the beginning. I hated Bali with passion, <laughs> absolute passion. But eventually, I learned to love Bali. Not only learned to, Bali, to love Bali, I also discovered my passion for it. We started from 5.30 in the morning all the way until 9 o'clock at night, six days a week we trained. At the beginning, I was so weak. Every time I tried to leap in the air, some of the teachers were laughing from my face. They would describe my legs as overcooked spaghetti with no strength. <laughs> I'd like to show you a second slide. That was me years later. So eventually, through the seven years of hard training, which eventually I had to work really hard to become good at it. And that was who I eventually transformed. I was quoted by the New York Times at one stage as one of the top 10 dancers in the world. Now, I will skip the second near miss in my life, but the third one was when I went to America on the first scholarship from the cultural field from, from China and a Mao. I was held against my will, being locked up inside the Chinese consulate in Houston for over 21 hours. When the four highly trained Chinese guards dragged me away, I truly thought that was the end of my life. When the guards slammed, behind the, uh, slammed the door in front of my face, locked me up, they said, we're gonna kill these bastards tonight. If it wasn't for sheer miracle, if it wasn't for Barbara Bush at the time who was on the board of the Houston Ballet, my life would end that night. I was a Chinese citizen. I was on the Chinese territory that night. But what is incredible was, that was, the, that was the night I was forced to dig deep, ask myself hard to answer questions, to be able to understand my true self, just what I want out of life. And to, along the way, not to lose that integrity self-belief and respect in oneself. So I didn't give in to their demand. Even you, if I refuse, they would kill me that night. But when you have come back from almost dead, when you have come back, come back from, have given up all hope in life, then once you gained a second chance, like I did, eventually allowed freedom, to do whatever I wanted to do is an amazing realization. Makes you treasure, value every single minute of your life. And makes you realize just what is important. So from that moment onwards, I promised myself I don't, I would never waste the rare opportunity, the freedom of life that I was awarded to, I was given. And I want to strive to make the biggest, biggest possible difference I could make it in other people's lives. So eventually I went on to have an incredible career, including us with some of the top ballet companies and eventually I came, I met an Australian girl, Queensland-born girl, when I was dancing in London. And eventually we danced together as dance partners. And she was the connection for me to come back to Australia. And now I've taken another major change in my life. After I finished my dancing career with Australian Ballet, then I went into finances and we have this wonderful business. But then I felt in my heart, there's a strong calling for me to come back to the dance world to make a difference 
in the new generation of dancers. So I am now the new artistic director of the Queensland Ballet, and my aspiration is to make Queensland Ballet one of the global powerhouse ballet companies, to bring a new generation of dancers to the international standard in Queensland. And looking back on my life, even though there's a, you know, I wrote my book, which is sold in over 20 countries, become an international bestseller. It's, it's currently, I think it's in the 46th reprint or something like that. And a movie was made based on my life. But looking back on my life, if I have to trace back the cause, the root of my success, it is no doubt, it's the seed that was planted in my heart as a child. Despite that tough, tough starvation experiences, daily struggle for food, just simply having enough food to fill your stomachs. But we had love from our parents, unconditional love. We had their care, their nurturing, they instilled valuable lessons and values in life. Every turn of my life, every test moment that there's two choices to make. Because of that background I grew up in, I tend to choose the right route to take. I don't think they're by accident. I don't think one's decisions made by accident. I think your early childhood, your adolescence period of times, your formative years is crucial to your success. So this is what I have to say to you. You all parents or parents to be. Just what kind of family environment you aspire to create? Working environment, school environment, especially family environment. I think if you are a leader, if you want to give something to the society, if you want to make a difference in your lives, family, to get your family right, is the starting point. That's the bedrock of any fabulous, wonderful society. Without that strong, value-oriented, generous, courageous family unit, we can't talk about a bigger picture of a society. So we have to be good human beings, good parents to our children, good colleagues, good friends to others first, before we can talk about meaningful differences we may want to make in the world or make the world a better place. Thank you very much.